Come to the event, get your friends to come to the event, name them, shame them, buy your tickets, brag about it, make it a status symbol, come on down, be a part of the crew, we want to see you there. Man, oh man, I love that uh, opening ad. Uh, Curtis did a great job. He's got such a talent uh, for you know promoting our stuff. And of course, everyone should indeed be getting their uh, tickets to the uh, Old Glory Club Conference. It's coming up pretty soon here, a little over two months. So get your tickets now. But gentlemen, we're gathered here once again for another exciting episode of Pony Express Radio. I am, of course, Mr. Red Hawk. I am once again joined by Mr. Charlemagne. How are you doing, sir? Uh, doing very good. Very happy. Um to have uh you know seen all of you guys over the weekend at our get together yeah it was great it's always a fun time for uh the ogc gang uh to get together at our secret bunker and uh make plans uh, for the future uh we are joined once again by mr pete quinones how are you sir doing well celebrating my uh 100 percent election here in alabama got 100 percent of the vote nothing strange about that <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic, excellent. And welcoming to the show, Mr. Kingbuild. How are you, sir? I'm good. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, that man, you got some amazing colors coming out of your uh, PFP. This could be super cool uh, for people in the audience watching. That's awesome. <laughs> Every time you talk, it's like, uh, I don't know, I imagine like Zeus on top of a mountaintop, you know, like firing down firebolt, <laughs> or lightning bolts or something. It looks great. Oh, yeah, you know, I see it now. <laughs> like, like tech noir or something, or, you know, yeah, it's pretty neat. Um, anywho. Well, gentlemen, uh, we have a bunch of uh, stories to talk about uh, this evening, and we might as well just start uh, right at the top here with the one that everyone's been talking about. So if anyone uh, has checked out Twitter today, you will have no doubt seen the absolute hordes of orcs that are um, you know, swarming the southern border here at El Paso. Why don't we pull up uh, this clip right here and see this? I mean, fellas, like in the camp of saints is literally playing out in real time at this point. You know, one of the things I want to make note of here uh, as you're looking at this horde here is that... um. It's noticeably uh, not all just like Mexicans. You know, there's 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 all shades and all colors that are there uh, in that horde, which just goes to show the the massive amount of like NGOs that are involved uh, funneling these people uh, into these places. You know, ugh, man, just look at this. It's literally like something out of a zombie movie. Uh, what what where are what are our opening comments here, gentlemen? Well, I um I think I found the tweet of the day. Um, our friend from about two hours north of me over in Georgia. Representative Mike Collins saying more shots were used to repel U.S. citizen Ashley Babbitt from the Capitol than on foreign invaders. Yeah, mm. that that's that's a winning tweet for today for sure. Absolutely, look at that. They're trying to hold him back like six dudes. Like, uh, oh man, I'm you know, just I, I can't say what needs to be done because we're on YouTube, but you know, I, I think everyone can put two and two together. So it looks like they're the the border that they're going through is the like the border before the border is that am i understanding what i'm seeing here correctly because then they're running up to this wall yeah this is the um uh, like the makeshift barbed wire fence that uh governor abbott was in a pissing match with uh biden over if you can actually even put up um you know the razor wire fence and such and uh clearly they broke it through there and this is the checkpoint at uh el paso and of course, I mean, this is just one section of the border where there actually is some kind of fencing or wall. As we know, there are many parts of the border that just have absolutely nothing and people can just walk right through. So this whole thing here is orchestrated as a photo op then. Oh, no doubt. If that's if that's the case, then that's what I would conclude that this this is a this is a photo op that's being 
I, I don't know to, to what end whose whose photo is this well the question could be i mean no doubt there's going to be a uh, i guess you'd call it a you know a, a propaganda media game being played on both sides you know uh you'll see this talked about all the time where uh particularly like uh the democrats and biden and such even though they literally have the power you know as the executive to close down the border at any time they'll say this all the time where it's like oh it's just those uh, republicans that are bogging down the uh, the border bill that's currently going on in the senate and as we all know if anyone actually pays attention you know they intentionally stock these bills with god knows what else you know a billion dollars for their friend next door 10 billion dollars for israel 40 billion dollars for ukraine you know, uh, fifteen uh, million dollars for butt plug studies or whatever the fuck else that they're uh, <laughs> spending money on these days. So there's that angle that people will take with it. It's like, oh, look at the Republicans. We could fix this right now if they pass this bill through. And then, of course, on the other side, uh, Republicans could definitely use this as a, oh, well, look at what how Biden is handling the situation. Like this, this wasn't occurring under Trump. We need to build that wall, kind of deal. When you know, <laughs> really, both of them don't have the answer at all. The the answer that. You know, needs to be said is uh, what we can't say on YouTube. So, well, I think a thousand Texans, guys who live around where Matt lives, could probably solve this problem pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they would enjoy it too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the, well, gents, this also opens up the uh, greater uh, conversation going on right now over how it has now been ruled that uh, illegal immigrants are able to carry guns uh, in the United States, apparently. And this is like, you know, the, the main talkie point going on right now here where, you know, he, here we go. Sharon Johnson uh, Coleman just ruled that illegal immigrants have the right to carry guns. So Sharon Johnson Coleman. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Was, <laughs> is that is that an what, 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 what does she look like? Yeah. Yeah. It's very it's very uh, heritage American sounding. Yes. Yes. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. darn. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Well. I mean, my first reaction to this is, well, I guess uh, we don't need any more background checks for when we go and buy guns at the gun store, right? I mean, if we're... Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. And of course, we know that this is not going to be uh, applied you know, to the actual Heritage American and founding stock people who want to uh, you know, exhibit their Second Amendment rights. Uh, we know exactly what this is for. This is for you know the client class of the regime to you know basically become turn into shock troops essentially you know they're they're gearing up for well i mean it's it's far more threatening the prospect of okay uh trump is saying right now that when he gets back into office oh we're gonna have the biggest uh, deportation campaign in the history of the united states now all of us here on that panel are very skeptical that that is even actually going to come through to fruition and happen even though we all think it should but the prospect of something like that going down becomes uh, much more difficult, shall we say, when all these illegals are now just able to carry firearms. Yeah, I actually didn't find this very surprising. Um, this is this is exactly how I would expect the Supreme Court, or this isn't the Supreme Court, but the courts in America, including the Supreme Court, uh, have generally ruled over the last several decades that the U.S. Constitution applies to everyone in the world. Um, I, I, I read a case of this once. I can't remember if it was gay marriage or it was abortion or free speech or something like that, but it was one of the big issues. Um, and in that case, the justices, you know, basically agreed that the U S constitution isn't just a document that applies to, uh, U S citizens in America when it says Congress shall make no laws, et cetera, et cetera. These are sort of rights extended to everyone that the U S government interacts with, uh, whether or not they're a U.S. citizen or not. If I recall correctly, Charlie, and I might be wrong, someone in the chat might correct me, but I think what you're talking about, there was like a First Amendment ruling case when they were trying to uh, like censor the social media companies or something to that effect, where it's like, oh, oh, therefore, anyone who interacts with these, therefore, is subject to the First Amendment, which means, like you just said right there, that's literally the entire planet. Yeah, I think it was a First Amendment case, and I mean... In terms of whether or not uh, illegal entry to the United States, um, I mean, that would make you a felon technically, right? So you shouldn't pass a background check. Uh, but the thing is, uh, the background check wouldn't be able to find that anyway. Um, if you, I mean, well, I guess it depends on what kind of ID you're running. Uh well, yeah, I mean, I know in uh, in many states, you know, uh, of course, the other thing uh, th uh, that goes with this, too, is that this is going to affect 
most stringently in uh, red states because they have looser uh, gun laws, right? So naturally, and of course, that they are intentionally funneling these people into more and more red states and not just blue states. So like in a red state, you know, for example, you could just walk up and show a driver's license, pass a background check, fill out a 4473 form and walk out with a gun and you could do it in like a half hour. Now, of course, that's going to be different in some of like your blue states, but we, we know that these uh, migrants are not just being sent to blue states. They're being sent everywhere. Yeah, I haven't uh, I haven't done a background check in a while. Do you put your social down? I can't remember. You can. It's optional. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is is there a way illegals could get through one without just failing the check? I mean, if you have a if you have a driver's license and uh, I, I don't know what the regulation is for that, for getting or not getting a driver's license. But no doubt, I'm sure there's some NGO that will like, I don't know, print it out for you or some shit at this point. I, I, I wouldn't even be surprised. But yeah, I mean, you go to a gun shop in most red states, you just show them a driver's license. And all you have to do is just fill out the 4473 form questions correctly. There's like 11 mm-hmm. questions, and as long as you say no to all of them except one, uh, the first one is like, uh, yeah, you're gonna walk out with it. Well, this is a very, you know, this is a boomer libertarian garbage, you know, that oh, we, I don't care if it's MS 13 walking over the border, they have because all of these rights are universal to everyone then they have a right to to carry a gun and boomers will say i've heard, i've hey I've, I've been on a lot of gun boards and they'll be like i think everyone should carry a gun you know you'll it, i mean it's not all of them but you will get those it's complete 2a absolutist um you know and i saw a libertarian on on twitter not being ironic being completely serious today that everybody in prison should have a gun um children you know grade school kids should have a gun it's just it's these universal rights man you know and every uh, apparently everybody is you know high iq enough or sentient enough to be able to exercise these rights or even understand what they may be but um yeah this is a real test this is one of those ones that even more than borders will tell you that libertarian that a lot of libertarians not all but a lot of libertarians and a lot of gun people are they side with the regime on so many things because of my rights and yeah if you think about it i mean it's it's the constant the u.s constitution or the second amendment it doesn't say that the second amendment excludes criminals right but that's that's just you know the last 1000 years of anglo-american jurisprudence like you're you lose your rights when you when you become a felon that's just the, the founders didn't write that down because that's that's the very concept of of criminal justice so but so to argue that because the the second amendment doesn't specifically include criminals it's just this bizarre uh paradox where apparently criminals don't lose any rights when they become a felon so how at that point how can there be any law at all i mean it doesn't well, hey guys hey guys when the 2a was written it was for everybody even the slaves the <laughs> slaves were supposed to get guns come on well here's well, yeah, the other these are universal rights it, it's but, bizarre it's bizarre that I mean, this is another thing that's like it, it's it's implicit right i mean a constitution is for I mean, it says it in there, you know, we, the people, our, ourselves and our posterity, it's, it's for the citizens. It's not for everyone on the planet, but you know, it's like these people will argue that because it doesn't say that explicitly, um, you know, therefore we can apply it to everyone, but it's just like, that's just, that's how a constitution works. I mean, (laughs) you have to be really stupid to imagine that that another country's constitution was was designed for everyone on the planet and like they had that in mind when they wrote it <laughs> i i used this example the other day um i don't know if it's still like this but um at least five or six years ago you could walk into a frenchman could walk into any um they sell suppressors in hardware stores there they're not regulated like they are here with a 200 dollars tax stamp now getting a getting a weapon to put it on might be a lot harder but there's a law that as an American, I can't walk in when I'm in France, I can't walk in there and buy a suppressor. I can't walk They're going to say, no, no, I'm sorry. It's against the law. I thought I have a right. I thought I have a universal right to suppressors. How come the French won't sell me a suppressor? 
Well, you know, the other funny thing you mentioned about um, uh, suppressors and such, Pete, I guarantee you uh, if this woman had the case in front of her, I don't know, someone like, um, who was that guy in Oregon? Eamon Bundy, right? If uh, if that yeah. guy came in front uh, of this girl's desk or something like that, you damn well know what side that she's going to make that ruling on. You know, like, oh, she'll she'll go and bitch about uh, assault rifles or ma- ma- high capacity magazines or something else like that. You know, I-, I guarantee you this woman isn't sitting there as a Second Amendment absolutist and why. She- and that's why she's making this ruling. Well, <clears throat> this gets into something I was actually discussing last night as well with uh, Mr. D on his uh, cocktail hour stream on Twitter. Um, I'm actually writing my speech for our, our old glory cup conference coming up in uh, a few months on this topic, uh, which is separation of powers. I mean, this is essentially just judicial review happening, right? Which is a, a power that the Supreme court and the lower courts then took for themselves in the Marbury versus Madison case, um, at the very beginning of the 19th century, um, Oliver uh, Semyagog brought up this point. I mean, the the idea that the it is the judiciary that interprets and changes the meaning of laws, uh, as opposed to the legislature, actually is a, a theft of the legislative power uh, by the ju- judiciary. And it's an important point, and I'm glad Mr. D hammers on this a lot. That that particular case that established judicial review, uh, that was simply the Supreme Court uh, doing a sort of coup and assuming basically the right to the legislative power um in the u.s the the court does not have this this mystical power of judicial review where it can decide the meaning of laws Um, this is a very strange thing um in anglo-american jurisprudence that that courts basically reinterpret and change the meaning of laws It's, it's the legislature that actually determines the meaning of laws um so i mean this this is all very technical um you know, I, I find this this interesting. Maybe other people don't. And yeah, obviously pointing out that I'm not trying to make some like my constitution argument, but it's important to to recognize that the the the, w- the reason these things happen is because the, the courts have been allowed to steal this power for themselves where they bas- basically steal the legislative power. Uh, you know, op- it doesn't make any sense. This is if you if you look at what judges would do throughout the rest of history, they would judge cases. Um, that's all they're supposed to do. They're not supposed to decide what laws mean. That's what the legislature does. Um, so very early on in the in the U.S. Uh, government, uh, this this was a this was sub- the the whole constitution was basically subverted uh, by this case. I think these kinds of conversations are actually really interesting because there's a, uh, <clears throat> I mean, no matter what happens going forward, there's still going to be statecraft and lawfare and like however the however this the regime does whatever form it dissolves into next there's still going to be a continuing tradition of legal history and parsing over uh political nuances and all these sorts of things and i think that there's uh there's a a cynicism that um a lot of us have that where we we're just kind of like, ah, oh, whatever. The, the whole thing's stupid. It's all gay. It's all, f- it's fake. Whatever. Well, yeah, it is, but something's going to have to replace it. And whatever replaces it is going to have to be populated by people who, who both share our values and are actually fluent in these sorts of things, are able to actually play these kinds of games and play them to win. So I, I am very happy to hear any of our guys who um, actually have this sort of interest in the, you know the legal and 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 historical aspects of statecraft and like listening to thomas 777 i've been going through and listening to his world war one series with you pete and yeah. one of the things that is just the, the man is an absolute is is he is the best of us I, I cannot get enough of his take on the world um but uh i've been really struck by the the way he goes into the psychology of each of these different representatives of statecraft and the different variables they're having to consider and weigh and comparing them the types of men even the even those who i might have consider i might consider evil or or um you know the bad guys or whatever you want to say um even those men were still very high quality people they were very sharp very calculating um extremely capable human beings and then you look at 
the world stage right now and the people who are occupying these same roles the like you know heads of state and ambassadorships and stuff these are clearly buffoons they're they're incompetent rubes that are just playing a role as like a you know a uh, like a plato's cave kind of a thing and so that makes me wonder where where are the actual statesmen the men who actually are, uh, you know, say what you want about him, but Henry Kissinger was a brilliant statesman. Where are those types of minds? What are those types of guys doing? Where are they focusing their efforts? That's it's something I don't have an answer to it. It's not a rhetorical question. It's just something that it makes me think about. Yeah, it's an excellent question uh, indeed. And of course, uh, King Pilled, you've been going around uh, lately uh, discussing a little bit more uh, on this topic about, you know, perhaps circulation of the elites and uh, who may or may not be uh, paying attention to that. But we'll get more to that later as we talk about Elon Musk. But another thing to talk about here, gents, uh, in line with these uh, illegals can carry guns. Uh, another story that's been popping up recently is the uh, the squatters' rights and such that are going on in a lot of blue states and blue cities, most notably uh, New York. Um, we have a clip of that uh, coming up here. And uh, also a, a clip from uh, what they're saying in Mexico is going on with these uh, squatters' rights and such. But uh, let's listen in on what's going on in New York right now as it relates to eviction of squatters. And her daughter with a property deed in hand went inside. She didn't just find her belongings inside. There's a man sleeping right there. Get out of my house. She found two men. They've called the police on me and I've called the locksmiths. I didn't come in illegally. The door was open. They took the man who told me he had been renting for two days out in handcuffs. Minutes later, a locksmith showed up, but police gave her a warning before they left. I may end up in handcuffs today if this man shows up here and says that I have illegally evicted him. Less than 10 minutes after police left and the locks were changed. The man who claims to be the one actually leasing the house shows up. Call the police again. This guy just literally broke down my door, broke through myself and my daughter to get in here. This guy just forced himself into my house. The man called the police on her. He says he signed a lease in October, but wouldn't tell us with who. Oh, Adele, you're getting arrested right now? I'm being arrested. For what? For being, in my, house, for being in my own home. Well, well, so there we go. The guy was renting the house for two days, apparently, and now has a uh, claim to the property. But uh, go on, Charlie. This stuff tells nicely from the previous story we just covered because it's it's the exact same concept of thieves' rights or criminals' rights. I mean, it's literally the same thing where this criminal has more protections under the law than do law-abiding citizens. I mean, this whole squatter's rights BS is, is not particularly new. It's It's always jarring to see it come up. And it, I mean, what, what can we say? It's just uh, evidence of a totally fucked up society where the police will come to your property that is obviously yours, which can be easily demonstrated uh, via years of documentation. But this random guy, because like he's claiming to be renting it and landlords have no rights, um, you know, he can just take it. Uh, you know, this is one of the downsides to living in suburbs. Uh, you know, this can't really happen in a place where I live, uh, you know, for reasons. Um, so one of the benefits of living in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's certainly true. I mean, it's just another, you know, uh, like rock in the mountain that is uh, the anarcho tyranny that we're living under uh, these days. And on top of that as well, I mean, it's going to become easier and easier and easier for uh, the regime to get stooges uh, like stooge police like this to come in and arrest this woman and side with the client classes of the regime that are all the criminals and degenerates of our society. Because who in their right mind wants to be a cop at this point? Who in their right mind wants to get involved and stop this nonsense from getting, uh, you know, moving any further? I mean, we, we've been talking about this previously on this stream, but uh, uh, the Marine, uh, Daniel Penny uh, in uh, New York, is about to uh, stand trial here uh, shortly. You know, for uh, choking out, um, you know, some uh, some jogger who is uh, disturbing people on the uh, subways and such. And we covered this uh, two weeks ago. They're literally now having National Guardsmen uh, patrolling New York subways at this point because crime is out of control. I mean, so <laughs> they're not sending their best because if you are, like, the state isn't going to back you up. You're going to be rotting in prison like Derek Chauvin is right now for basically doing his job, right? And we're just going to side with criminals every single step of the way. Well, I mean, we're... And we're starting to see vigilantes start stepping up. Even in this case, a couple people showed up to, you know, basically 
kick him out of the house, do it physically. Um, we're going to see more of that. You know, I, I did a, um, I did my monthly round table with uh, Dark Enlightenment, Jose Nino and Charles Fadil. And Charles made this point that it, it's going to come to wives looking at their husbands and just saying, fix it. And I don't care how you fix it. Don't come home and tell me how you fixed it. But all of this needs to be fixed. It's happened before in history, and it's probably going to have to happen again. This yeah. Is, it's very interesting that the people who are most affected by something like this, as you pointed out, Charlemagne, is the people in the city and in the suburbs. So basically, this is the regime just beating the shit out of their own people. And I, I it's... I, I think really where where our energy would be best suited is or where like where energy needs to be directed is at ensuring that there's legal defense available in the event that something like this happens and the person because uh, you know that this sort of thing is being fomented specifically for this reason so that you can get some sort of a of a you know an event that pops off that combines the last two the last two subjects we've been talking about and it turns into a gigantic media parade. So we need to have people on our side who are prepared for that, who are prepared to defend that person. Um, this is also an area where sheriffs can make a really big difference. The sheriffs are, mm -hmm. have an underrated amount of power in their, their mm -hmm. domains. So if there, you could, as, as a sheriff, if you get sheriffs elected in the right places, and obviously that's a, that's a longer term sort of a thing I think the urban areas are fucked you know you, you, our, our our goal isn't to save the urban areas our goal is to save our own communities and one of the ways you can do that is by having sheriffs who are willing to not tolerate this sort of thing because as Charles is saying we're reaching the point where the men are going to have to just start making exceptions and that's a tough that's a tough prisoner's dilemma because it's kind of like you don't want to be the one guy who moves when nobody else does and you get whack-a-mold. Um, so you kind of all have to move in unison. But I'm reminded of Jamie Dimon when he was talking about immigration. Uh, this was at Davos. And he said, he said all of my liberal friends in, in the blue cities are all very concerned about this, this mass immigration thing happening. So the all it's going to take is the liberal white ladies having one of their friends have something like this happen to him and she starts shit going on in a Facebook group and things like this can turn pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, there definitely is going to have to, you know, uh, require some kind of watershed moment uh, like we've been describing here to, you know, get people to actually react accordingly. I mean, I don't know if anyone saw this, but um, I guess apparently a uh, Kyle Rittenhouse had a, um, like a, I don't know, like a, the equivalent of a town hall or like an event or something like that at the University of Memphis uh, yesterday. And it, it was also like a flashback of like what was going on at Berkeley in like 2015, 2016, you know, kind of deal. Like the cops weren't really defending uh, people going into the event. It, it was a bunch of BLM people showed up and all this stuff. I mean, like the, crime in America is just completely out of control uh, at this point. And it's it's abundantly clear to anyone who's paying attention that the, the people in charge are not doing anything to fix the situation. And no doubt you are going to have more and more people like uh, Kyle Rittenhouse uh, step up. I mean, uh, I don't know if anyone paid attention to this, but like last week, the entire like mainstream celebrity circuit from like uh, Mark Ruffalo and all these other weirdos were praising Joseph Rosenbaum. The literal fucking pedo that uh you know uh, uh kyle uh capped off uh this mortal coil i mean it, it really is it, it's just bizarre to think about at this point i mean it's certainly been the most dangerous time to be in america since i've been alive but yeah uh, yeah, and, and here we go. A perfect segue here. And so here is a um uh, a TikTok video of some guy uh, down in Mexico encouraging people uh, at the border, migrants, to come take advantage of these uh, squatters' rights uh, in America. It's like, go on over. You know, the the house is inhabited. We can take it. We can claim it. Seize it. Is that the guy who steals luggage, like cousin or something? Yeah, yeah, really. It does look like him, doesn't it, Pete? <laughs> God, uh, the, I, don't know. Look, I think, look at this I think genetic if, fuck too, just screaming. I think, 
I think the only reason he wants to come here is to try and get a free transgender surgery or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Jeez, yeah, this is this is uh I mean, how do these how do these squatters rights um laws I mean every every red state should be preemptively um, addressing and changing all of their squatters rights laws if they even need to be i don't i'm not super up on my squatters rights laws um but i mean i can't imagine people where i live right now tolerating this sort of thing yeah well uh we'll talk about uh shortly uh king peel what the uh, republican uh, lawmakers are uh, doing in their states uh and while uh, these things are going on, we'll get there. Don't worry. But first, we must uh, read uh, the super chats uh, that have piled up here. So let's start uh, going through a couple of these uh, really quick. Um, as always, guys, thank you very much uh, for your patronage. Uh, we appreciate every single one of you, and every dollar uh, does go to excellent use. Uh, we've got some big things uh, planned coming up uh, in the future, and uh, some announcements will be made um, next week uh, on the channel as well on a couple of our uh, initiatives that we're working on. So uh, watch this space. But anywho, uh, Pete Budapest, always one of our uh, strongest soldiers for $2. Hello, friends. No fishing in the Rubicon. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, eventually, eventually <laughs> it's going to have to get crossed. Absolutely. Um, Garfellow Roosevelt for 15 bucks. Thanks for the great show. You guys are the best. OGC is the white pill. Just promise me that no matter how many times y'all visit the bunker, it never turns into a, a Fuhrer bunker scenario. Uh, no, it will not. Yep. We, have way, we have way too much fun at those events for it ever to get to that point. <laughs> uh, let's see um tunes tyranny for uh two bucks the migrants are uh gifting us and capistan oh yeah exactly i was getting in uh fights with uh libertarians today uh because uh people were um talking about that uh the god-awful tweet from uh the libertarian party of louisiana that was talking about how you know the same thing we we're talking about how we need to uh, every single migrant has the right to uh carry a firearm and such and of course i was getting in fights with uh these people on this topic and it's so bizarre because uh, these, the fundamental reason why so many people dislike uh, libertarians is because they always come to bat for the most unjust people in the, uh, in, inside an argument. It's like, okay, you're going to side with the criminals. They're knowingly and willingly breaking a law. They're all probably 80 IQ morons that have never read Hayek, never read Rothbard. None of them are coming over here to, you know, uh, found Ancapistan. They're coming here from a Gibbs. We all know they're coming here from a Gibbs. So why do you have to die on this hill of, you know, equality is so central to everything that you believe in, everyone being equal under the law and such that you're literally signing your own death warrant. I mean, there are guys that spend like 100K on like OnlyFans girls and at least they actually get something out of it. Like what do libertarians get out of by being useful idiots for these people? <laughs> uh, they, I don't know, they get to be right in their own heads. Yeah, yeah they, I mean, the, the former, um, I guess two th 2020 a libertarian party candidate for president Joe Jorgensen tweeted today if you only support the second amendment when it applies to people who look like you you don't understand the second amendment and somebody followed that up and said that's a ridiculous statement I support law abiding citizens those who are not should not be given the rights granted to a citizen and she followed that up with one of the greatest woman moments on twitter I speed. Should I not be allowed to have a firearm now? <laughs> uh, I mean, at this at this point, I'm for TLD. I, I think TLD <laughs> is like on the table. I mean, look, liber libertarianism is just politics for redditors. It's like if you just took Reddit and turned it into a political party, that's that's all it is. It's yeah. it's just it's just there to get up dudes from winning arguments within your own arbitrary frame you've set up, which is exactly what every single subreddit is. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Indeed. All right. Um, carrying on here to uh, our good friend, uh, Luth Emplar for five bucks. Wow. I didn't know slaves for three fifths of a gun <laughs> when they arrived here. <laughs> 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 you he's always got some hilarious um uh, uh, uh yeah. sends in. he's a good guy uh, and i look forward to uh seeing him at the next conference uh he's a good guy got a lot to offer um 
Man, uh, if we have a spreadsheet in the back of our top super chatter, Paladin YYZ is by far uh, at the top. I mean, I know he was getting in a betting, almost like an auction uh, last week during the musings of the interior stream when he was coughing out hundreds of bucks. But man, oh man, thank you so much for your support, sir. But for $50 tonight, I think that deserves a gold clip, I love gold. Doug. The look of it, the taste of it, the smell of it, the texture. I love gold. Yes, thank you very much. We do indeed uh, love gold over here. So uh, Paladin YYZ for 50 bucks. Uh, I can't say what needs to be done because we are on YouTube. Yep, very much true. Here's a quote from uh, Bernie Mac in Ocean's 13. Nuff said. Yeah, uh, pretty much everyone uh, knows it. Uh, everyone can see it with their plain eyes. You know, I mean, again, I, 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 I was tweeting out earlier today uh, what my thoughts are on this matter. People can go look at that. Anywho. Um, Lou Templar again for um, uh, five bucks. A question to ask, who uses the address on election day? Oh, now that's an interesting point. No doubt that's an angle people will take with this for sure. Now, mm. who, who knows what level of a, a next election uh, shenanigans uh, will be going on uh, this year in the fall here? Because I, I don't know about you guys, but I have absolute full confidence in the Republican Party from the top on down that they've done the best job to give us the most secure and freest election in history this year. They've had four years of sitting with their thumbs up their ass. I don't know about you guys, but I know they're going to do a great job of protecting election integrity. <laughs> uh, anyhow. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Mr. Clockwork for um, uh, 10 bucks. Um, all of the panel and Thomas triple seven are doing great, uh, are doing great at work to redefine the right in modern America away from conservatism and toward American instincts. Thank you all. Keep fighting. Well, we're not stopping anytime soon, sir. And, uh, thank you very much for your patronage. Uh, Mr. Brandon Schill here for, um, uh, two bucks. I'd love an OGC on how you all found your faith. Oh, yeah. Well, I was baptized Catholic. Um, that's basically how it works if you're a Catholic. Yep. <laughs> yeah, more or less. Um, I'm I'm in a weird spot. I got baptized in uh, Eastern Orthodox and Catholicism as a kid, so uh, a weird household growing up. But uh, so so I guess I get to choose. Um, but uh, anywho, uh, let's see. And uh, getting all caught up here, Joshua BB for two bucks. Libertarians are not to be taken seriously ever. Certainly. All right. What did Thomas say? I was recording with Thomas today, and he said, um, "Modern the problem with uh, modern political ideology is that it's self-referencing. It just abolishes metaphysics altogether." Yes. Yeah, that's a very interesting yep. point. Yeah, Thomas is yeah. such a sharp guy especially after spending yeah. uh, many, many hours on a long car ride uh, <laughs> with him. Yeah, so we have some very interesting conversations, to say the least. Um, anywho, all right, gents, uh, we're all caught up. Let's move on uh, to our next story here. So uh, <laughs> speaking of uh, Republicans uh, sitting uh, with their thumbs up their ass for a number of years and doing everything to shore up the defenses of their state, from everything to squatters' rights, to uh, migrants coming in, people illegally handling firearms. Let's check in and see what uh, the best and brightest uh, Christy Nome has been doing in her state of South Dakota recently. Uh, no doubt people saw this uh, last week, but we weren't here to cover it, so we're back here again. So uh, Christy Nome uh, went out of her way to do what every good Republican should do and stand up for the certain group we're not allowed to talk about and be sure to protect anyone from saying anything bad about the certain group. And uh, in that photo, she managed to round up every single Jew in the entire state of South Dakota, apparently. Um, I think she was importing. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Yeah. So uh, Christy Nome has signed a historic legislation to protect our Jewish people against anti-Semitism. Oh, man, I'm sure that is just on the absolute front of every single South Dakota resident's list of things that need to be addressed in their state. We need to make sure that no anti-Semitism takes place in South Dakota. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm... well, are we not allowed to talk about them anymore? I mean, it kind of seems like we're allowed now. At least on Twitter. Yeah, on Twitter we definitely are. Yeah, which uh, which is a nice change. I mean, it's it's literally. I don't know, man. They've they've gotten a they've gotten a lot of mileage out of the whole Holocaust thing, but it's like you can't just like 
like demand that you know the United States like eternally serve Israel and pivot its entirely entire economy into wiping out every single life form in Gaza and like just like you've kind of run out of gas on the whole like Holocaust card. It's like I'm sorry, guys. Like the the jig is up at this point. Like you're, you're kind of going too far here. You know, South Dakota is doing the whole like anti-Semitism laws. So you can't just invoke that forever. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that actually run out of steam. Well, well, it, it, I had an interesting thing that happened today. I was watching somebody who was bringing up the USS Liberty, and uh, someone commented that was fifth. That was fifty six years ago. Why are you bringing up stuff from fifty six years ago? I said because <laughs> the same people who did that bring up something that happened eighty years ago and won't stop fucking talking about it. Yeah, it's also just that you know it's something in Europe that is totally irrelevant to Americans. To be honest, like it's just. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see it just not work anymore. Um, after the the state of Israel was just going totally insane. You know the other thing about this, and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be I'm gonna choose my words carefully here, but uh, let's just say for the sake of the argument that uh, if this extremely horrible thing, generation defying defining uh, incident occurred uh, with your certain group of people, and then there was a foreign nation. At a great expense of treasure and blood, decide to go across an entire ocean and save you from that extreme horror. I think the rational choice would be to be kissing the feet of the people that saved you literally for the rest of your fucking life instead of being a vindictive group of people that do nothing but subvert the people that saved you. So, yeah, that's that's just my two cents on the matter. Well, well they you don't really hated the people who saved them. So, I mean, it's where you know once you know the history once you once you start going back and reading the history beyond you know just like the founding of the state of israel or something like that go back hundreds of years you just see that there's no there's no when they're treated when they're treated nicely there's there's no thanks they subvert when they're treated poorly they complain why are they treated poorly because they subvert it's just a circle going round and around and around I mean, you don't even have to get into the the history or, you know, ideas like them controlling the media or whatever. It's just like, OK, look, even taking all the claims about World War II at face value, it's like the, the country that did this to you was annihilated off of the face of the earth. Um, you know, we hung their leaders. Uh, you've been you've been given every possible like concession over the last 80 something years um in relation um to this genocide of your people it's like and the united states had nothing to do with it anyway so it's like what, what the hell man like this is just just patently stupid it's like on its face it's it's dumb to expect you know to be able to demand anything of americans at this point on the basis of of this like historical grievance you have it's, it's over and settled and it's it's your problem um so, so just fuck off. <laughs> so, so Charlie, there's there's one thing to say uh, about your point right there. That yes, uh, it is absolutely absurd to, that anyone takes these uh, critiques at face value at this point. And then it's a whole nother level of absurdity on top of it for Republican governors to literally be signing these kinds of laws, it, make, basically making it illegal to say very basic things. I mean, uh, Cringe Walker just pointed out something in the chat right here about uh, making uh, the the gospel illegal in the Dakotas. It's like. Yeah, I mean, look at here, uh, some of the points in this um, uh, uh, bill right here, uh, using the symbols and images associated with classic uh, anti-Semitism, i.e. Uh, claims of Jews killing Jesus. It's like, well, that literally happened, and that's literally in the Bible. So uh, what is this now? And and also, I mean, I want to stress again, I mean, South Dakota has a population of like 300 Jewish people. How is this important in any way uh, in their state? And then on top of that as well, can anyone here imagine any Republican of any stripe in this country, not even a governor, not even like the, the lowest of the low, like representatives or something, uh, pushing forward for leg legislation like this for heritage Americans? They'd be laughed out and thrown out of every single committee, every single, you know, you know uh, Hall of Congress. They'd be fired. People would be condemning them all over the place. You know, I'm so sick of this discussion at this point, especially since October 7th. I'm done with this. Well, and again, it's like, okay, so the Germans did bad things to Jews in World War II. So did the Japanese, the Chinese. Like, do we need to have, like, special laws protecting the Chinese from 
Japanese slurs and aggression in the United States. I mean, this is part of the same war. The United States was uh, a third party on in both parts of that conflict. It's like, what's what's going on here? This 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 type of again, this is just entirely against like Anglo American ju- jurisprudence. Um, and it's you know, it's just a, it's a stain. It's just a complete stain on any politician who would even uh, you know pass such legislation in the first place. Well, to take ideology out of it altogether and just look at it from political, I mean, maybe she's thinking of running for, you know, she wants national office. So this is her way of, you know, signaling to APAC that she's on her side. I mean, that's one of the simplest ways to do it. I mean, it's what it is, is the these governors are bought off they're they're bought off right up front they they're told what the i remember when uh, jesse ventura got elected in uh, minnesota nobody expected him to get elected he said on on inauguration day he was taken into a room there were eight guys who surrounded him and they were just quite throwing questions at him what are you planning on doing what what are you what are you going to do what what, what do you what do you plan on changing in this state you know, I mean, I just until you have a governor who's be who's willing to just basically give the middle finger to to all of this to to all of the um, the entrenched elites that quote unquote elites that are there right now, and you have somebody who's willing to step up and say, you know what, I am going to pass laws for heritage Americans that you can't say anything bad in this state about. I mean, nothing, what's going to change? What's going to change? Nothing. Nothing. So, I mean, this is this is the road we're on for this. You just got to build, try to do stuff locally. And, you know, if the governor in your state is this much of a cuck, you just ignore. You, you just make the decision whether you're going to ignore. I mean, how, where is this and where is this going to be enforced? It's going to be enforced online. No one's going to enforce this like face to face unless there's some kind of like major blow up somewhere or something like that. I mean... This is all just politics. This is just politics. I do yeah. think it's interesting that we're seeing um, more and more indicators that the, I mean, for the last several years, it's been very clear that the the tribe has been operating um, first and foremost out of the Democratic Party, and now they're they're making their bones with they're they're I guess they're. They're they're coming to the conclusion that that Trump is basically inevitable here, and you had Kushner in front of the ADL last week, I think, or week before, I don't remember exactly when, um, telling them basically like we need to be we need to be better friends with evangelical Christians, we need to be better friends with with MAGA essentially, and there's been a lot of these <clears throat> little indicators starting to to pop up of major institutional powers. And then there's the Democrats have a major issue with um, intra-Democrat coalitions. Um, and you have the entire uh, very bleeding heart libs who think that Israel is a is a neo-colonialist oppressor. And so then, of course, the, the upper class blue uh, Jews are all, uh, you know, the Democratic Party won't protect our interests well enough. So it's interesting seeing them pivot their way back toward the Republican party and then essentially becoming it's, it's going to become a wedge issue within the Republican party because there are interests who uh, uh, do not, I mean, the entire America first movement happening within the the Republican party uh, to some extent or another does not want to make peace with these kinds of people. So uh, you're going to, you're basically, you're getting both parties fracturing along this issue right now. Yeah. And, um, you know, as, and also as much as it uh, pains me to say it as well, uh, you know, there's a lot of people are saying like, oh, like, you know, uh, it's going to be great when uh, we get Trump back and such and everything like this. But at the same time, I mean, (laughs) Trump might be like, what, like the most Zionist president that's ever existed in American history. (laughs) I mean, he's certainly up there. Right. So it's not like this issue is really going to be, uh, uh, fixed with the Trump presidency, although uh, other issues uh, very well might move it, be moving in much better directions. Yeah, well, I mean, one thing about Trump, though, is he he actually really hates war. And now that Israel has decided to go murder hobo mode on Gaza, that might cause a, a bit of tension there. Yeah, yeah it could be interesting. 
there's an interesting thing to parse that I've been picking up on and trying to understand, which is, I guess it would basically, you might say it's like the difference between Zionist and pro-Israel. And that, and the, that's actually a meaningful distinction, I think, that at least other people make about themselves. So they don't see themselves as a, a Zionist person would see a pro-Israel person as f- indistinguishable from us, essentially. Because it's not enough to just be pro-Israel. You have to you have to believe that America should exist for the sake of Israel. Um, and so well, Nimrata, Nimrata Haley certainly thinks so. <laughs> right, right. So there's so that that's like the 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 I guess GOP Inc. kind of um, part of the party, and then a lot of the new right um, representatives that are beginning to make their presence known within the Republican Party are all um, much more influenced by America First, and so even though there are some of them who are pro-Israel, but I think that, that there's a meaningful distinction to be made between pro-Israel and Zionist. And I think that's, that may be the issue itself that, um, that actually is kind of like the, the axis around which the new Republican party forms. Well, that's certainly an interesting point. I mean, you know, for myself and I don't know if anybody else on the panel uh, uh, disagrees or agrees the same, but you know, I more or less don't really give a shit uh, about this conflict other than the fact that America is forced to uh, be involved with it. If, uh, if Israel wants to, you know, uh, take the region for themselves, I mean, if they can with their own uh, blood and their own sweat and their own tears and their own treasure, I mean, more power to them. It's not my fight. I don't have a dog in it. It's not my business, but you know, I do have a problem that uh, America is forced to uh, kiss the feet of this country that's not even as big as New Jersey that has an extremely, you know, disproportionate amount of power as to how politics is conducted uh in my country if someone wants to call that pro-israel i mean okay but i mean neither side is a friend to america no and it's 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 a particularly problematic country too i mean they've just been in a they've been in a cold war with their neighbors for like 70 years i mean obviously it's been a hot war too. their entire existence Um, (laughs) you know and it's like okay it's like we put um you know we buried the hatchet on the the actual cold war between the u.s and soviets it's like at some point you guys are going to have to like figure out you know how to actually get along with your neighbors and you know it's pretty hard to be friends with somebody who just wants to be uh, an eternal pariah state like that's not really a workable relationship like you need to figure out how you're gonna work things out with your neighbors um and israel just refuses to do that well it's become very clear from writings that i've read from mostly jewish writers over over um the last 100 years and 150 years that they they're always innocent they cannot even when they're guilty they can't admit it and you see that all the time and so basically when you're the eternal victim It's almost as if you have to have somebody keep an enemy close to you so that you can say, look, look at how they treat me. They just shot a bottle rocket at me. They just threw a rock at me. That's why we had to shoot them in the nuts. Um, it's, it's It's this victim status that keeps the world, and then when you control the press in, you know, the major countries, it keeps the world looking at you as, oh my God, they're, they're just, I feel so sorry for them. And imagine that existence. Imagine that that's what your existence is. You want to feel feel sorry for them. That's one of the reasons I've really tried to stop talking about them a lot lately. Because I think that if you, once you feel, realize just exactly how much power and how much control they have, you can concentrate on them so much that you become like them. That you start sounding like them. Well, it's also like the the current war. I mean, well, the whole situation in the Middle East is actually pretty similar to the provocations aimed at Russia that that started the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, like, Trump actually went a pretty long way in terms of trying to normalize relations with Israel, but of course, or between Israel and their neighbors. But they just like like you said, they want to be victims. I mean, look at it this way: like, it's not like the Muslim countries are like obsessed with like destroying the state of Israel Israel per se. Of like there's probably some sort of diplomatic maybe two-state solution that that could work out the the problem is israel has a, a nuclear arsenal aimed at all of its neighbors perpetually it's like this is not a workable situation it's like you can't like sit here and aim nukes at every one of your neighbors and then like act like you're like they're the bad guy here like you have to remember that israel's a nuclear power none of these other countries are like israel has the capability to wipe out um any number of their cities like on a whim and and 
you know, look at their behavior over the last few months. I mean, this country is just like um, on some sort of, uh, you know, they're just going nuts over there in, in Gaza. And it's like, why you can't, it, you know, imagine if that, that country was next to you. It's like, you wouldn't feel comfortable with these people. Um, it's, it's, yeah. Well, once you understand it, you also have to take into consideration that they, this is just maybe what they want. They may just want to be isolated from the rest of the world as long as they have. I think when they when they panic is when people in Washington, D.C. aren't responding to them. They're not getting their way in Washington, D.C., and they're not getting their way in London. As long as they have power in those two cities and people are pulling the strings for them, they're fine. Um, I think they're fine with the rest of the world and everybody hating them as long as their coterie in the in these two places and new york city of course too are are okay with them but there is a real there's a real chance that this could just be done on purpose to make themselves the ultimate pariahs and they have enough support with the evangelical base in this country where that'll always be um always bow down for them that they're just like eh, we're fine with being hated we've been hate we've been hated everywhere we've gone for 3500 years eh, what, what, what's what, what does it matter now well yeah that's basically what i was saying i'm like i'm agreeing with your point there like the, it's clearly what they want they had they had opportunity for normalization with the Trump admin, and they've soundly rejected that now. Uh, there's everyone kind of understands at this point that there's never going to be there is no two state solution in Israel's this permanent pariah state. Basically, like clearly they want to be hated, and they don't want to, you know, be quote unquote safe. Um, yeah, and 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 yeah, like they. We, we see this all the time. Uh, Israel loves anti-Semitism like that. They want anti-Semitism to exist. They provoke it on purpose, like with these laws in South Dakota. That's like the point It's not actually to prevent it. It's literally the opposite. Yeah, it's to find it under every single rock and tree and to change definitions of words to therefore uh, make it uh, anti-Semitic or not. I mean, there was that clip of uh, Candace Owens uh, interviewing some uh, rabbi of some kind uh, earlier this week. And. You know, he was taking her to task over calling uh, Rabbi Shmuley's daughter a hag. And it's like, well, apparently hag is now an anti-Semitic term now. I mean, it's just they're finding them everywhere. Well, it's also like uh, Israel and the Mossad. They don't give a fuck about the Jews in America or in Europe. These are just political pawns to them in order to, uh, you know, advance their own country's position. Um, so it's entirely cynical anyway. I mean, they had plenty of they had plenty of chance to get get their own people out of Europe in the 1930s, and they didn't. <laughs> no, that, that's that's one that's one thing you wondered too. Like, I just reviewed this this book on um on my my blog about uh, like 1938 uh, Germany, basically, and you know this it they talk about how you know the the Jews are running businesses there. It's like, why didn't you like leave at this point? <laughs> I don't know. It's just weird. You know, it's like. You because it, it's not it's not like the the Germans like just rounded them all up and arrested them like before the war right they were still just like operating their businesses uh you know with their their stars of David marked and everything like that but it's just like why didn't you just like did you not see the writing on the wall here for the last ten years like why don't you just like leave uh, I don't know and it's it's not like there are other German speaking countries right like Switzerland and whatnot uh, I don't know but the pattern of behavior in the in the twentieth century especially. Uh, and the 21st, I guess, too, we're well into it. It just demonstrates that they want to be hated. They want to be victims. Um, and they're, they're not interested in actually being safe or being friends with anyone else. Have you guys seen the movie The Believer? Oh, yeah. Great film. Some of the some of the monologues that Ryan Gosling has in that movie are. Um, they'll make your skin crawl, The knowing that this I, I guess did the rest of you guys have you seen it? I have not. No, I have not. No. Okay. So the the plot is that Ryan Gosling is like a neo Nazi, and then you find out along the way that he actually is Jewish, and he's like a self hating Jew. This movie was was written and produced by Jews and very highly acclaimed by Jews of the the self hating. Uh, the self-hating Nazi Jew who, spoiler alert, at the end of the movie, he uh, um, blows himself up. 
and uh, and in so doing saves a a bunch of Jews. Um, but he has he has some really epic monologues in there that really illustrate exactly the point that you're talking about. This is one of them. He says, "Let me put it this way: Who wants to destroy the Jews? Who wants to grind their bones into the dust? And who wants to see them rise again, wealthier, more successful, powerful, cultured, more intelligent than ever?" Then you know what we have to do? We have to love them. What? Did he say love the Jews? It's strange, I know. But with these people, nothing is simple. The Jew says all he wants is to be left alone to study his Torah, do a little business, fornicate with his oversexed wife. But it's not true. He wants to be hated. He longs for our scorn. He clings to it as if it were the very core of his being. If Hitler had not existed, the Jews would have invented him. For without such hatred, the so-called chosen people would vanish from the earth. And this reveals a terrible truth and the crux of our problem as Nazis. The worse the Jews are treated, the stronger they become. Egyptian slavery made them a nation. The pogroms hardened them. Auschwitz gave birth to the state of Israel. Suffering, it seems, is the very crucible of their genius. So if the Jews are, as one of their own has said, a people who will not take yes for an answer, let us say yes to them. They thrive on opposition. Let us cease to oppose them. The only way to annihilate this insidious people once and for all is to open our arms, invite them into our homes, and embrace them. Only then will they vanish into assimilation, normality, and love. But we, but we cannot pretend. The Jew is nothing if not clever. He will see through hypocrisy and condescension. To destroy him, we must love him sincerely. If the Jews are strengthened by hate, wouldn't this destruction that you speak of, whether it's by love or any other means, wouldn't that make them more powerful than they are already? Yes, infinitely more. They would become as God. It's the Jews' destiny to be annihilated so they can be deified. Jesus understood this perfectly, and look what was accomplished there with the death of just one enlightened Jew. Imagine what would happen if we killed them all. Yeah, I mean, uh, that that movie is definitely a must-watch. I'm surprised uh, you two haven't seen it, actually. Someone actually reviewed it. It might have even been Thomas. It was uh, Devin Stack. Oh, yeah, it was it was Stack. Yeah, definitely. I would recommend watching the film and then watching Devin Stack's review of it. Um, that, that is some good watching there. Uh, I mean, just latching onto the word assimilation there as, as well. It's like, you know, kind of a side point. But, uh, you know, is the, the existence of people, is it not like the best argument ever that uh, assimilation doesn't exist? I mean, how do these people spend, you know, almost 2000 years uh, in in European society, and then hundreds in the great melting pot of America, but they're somehow still a distinct people. Um, I mean, how do you explain that if uh, assimilation exists? Yeah, isn't there a whole um uh, Cudahy uh, book sp specifically about this? I know uh, it's a book that BAP talks about all the time. Uh, uh, is the word civility or something like that? I, uh, I'm blanking on the name right now, but yeah, it addresses uh, just this point you're discussing right now about uh, Jewish assimilation into the West. Well, probably time to move on because yeah. we got more topics and we've uh, we do. Yeah, we in. yeah, we spent um uh, quite a bit here, but we have uh two more stories to cover here. So but first, um let's go through the more super chats that have piled up. Quite a few of them have uh piled up as so we've been talking on this topic. Um uh anywho, uh let's see, uh Sergey Lewis for uh two bucks. Uh if we must only high points uh for illegals. Uh let's see here. A uh, Casey Stark for fifty bucks. Thank you very much, sir. You know, I think that deserves us uh, some gold I love uh, as well. The look of it, the taste of it, the smell of it, the texture. I love gold. <laughs> love that clip. Anyhow, uh, great content. Uh, keep it up. Keep up the work. Yes, we are not stopping anytime soon. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Luce and Flower become already addressed this, but anywho, five bucks. Uh, why would they make the gospel illegal uh, in the Dakotas? Yeah, yeah, strange. Uh, yeah, a strange point indeed, of course. Uh, yeah, like that we already discussed, but yeah, uh, Spud Ruckus for uh, uh, five bucks. Candace Owens' recent stream with a rabbi. Yeah, I was, uh, was talking about this. Yeah, uh, recent stream with a rabbi trying to uh, feck all over her was hilarious. Uh, she was having none of it, and he uh, did not come off looking great. Oh well, yeah, I mean, uh, have any of these um, uh, uh, Jays come off looking great since uh, October uh, the seventh? I mean, uh, Ben Shapiro's been foaming at the mouth like every single day, just wanting to turn Gaza into nothing more than like a radioactive uh, waste dump. So, uh, let's see, uh, Garfello Roosevelt here for five bucks. Uh, uh, one group gets uh, anti hate laws, uh, gets uh, racist books uh, about them promoted on MSM. Yep, very true indeed. 
Um, let's see. Uh, Lou Templar again for five bucks. Um, I've seen Palestinians in New York with an LGBT sticker with the text Liberty, Guns, uh, uh Peace of Allah, uh, I guess that means. Uh, Trump. Politics is getting silly. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. I'm trying to reconcile all of those. Yeah, that is, that is very weird. But New York's a weird place. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, a Paladin YYZ again, adding to his war chest that he's given to us. You know, uh, whenever we get an OGC a studio, we need to have like the the Paladin YYZ room of uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll give him a wing of the building. You know, uh, whatever he wants. Uh, you know, we'll name it after him. Uh, uh, for another 50 bucks. I think he deserves another gold. I love gold. The look of it, the taste of it, the smell of it, the texture. I love gold. We're going to need uh, more variations on that if people are going to keep being this generous. Yeah, this is true. This is true. Uh, it's funny because like a black pill has like a six or seven different ones uh, <laughs> that he likes to use. You know, so he keeps it fresh. But yeah, well, we'll get there. Um, all right. This is not difficult, guys. Just imagine what the New York Times. Uh, just imagine what the New York Times had a headline uh, that says Supreme Court bans falling in love. What are you going to do? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it is just going to come to the point like we were discussing earlier. It's going to have to get to the point where, you know, everyone does it all at once, basically. Right. You know, like uh, or or people just get ballsy enough that they don't care and they're going to stick their heads out. And, yeah, maybe some people are going to get squashed. But in the end, you know, the only way out is through. Right. So I think there um, are, are at local levels, there are ways of, of being able to insulate yourself and your communities from this. And I mean, at, this sort of thing needed to happen yesterday, but might as well start happening today. Having people proactively um, putting themselves in positions to do something about it, whether that's running for elected office or supporting someone who's running for elected office or um, funding, lobbying for legislation or whatever. Like <clears throat> part of the reason why Democrats wind up being so successful with all of their, their anti-civilizational approaches is because they have all of these people who are booted up constantly ready to go, ready to take advantage of every new opportunity, which puts them in the driver's seat. So, I mean, if the only way out is through, then we're going to have to have people who can play the same game and figure out how to do it better than them. Because one of the, I guess one of the big white pills is the way that, uh, what was it, uh, Pete, you said something the other day that, um, so you recognize that they run everything and then you recognize there's a massive competency crisis. And when you put those two thoughts together, it's like they suck at running things. So they've, they've created a, a, a Absolute system, system. Yeah. They've created a system that's supposed to govern the entire world, a massively complex detailed system. And the method that they've used to create that system is destroying the competence of the people in the system. So now they, now they own an incompetent system. So it's just a matter of time before it self-destructs. And the question is, to what extent are we going to go, are we going to get caught up in the in the fireball when it goes down? And to what extent can we just begin porting ourselves out of it? Yeah, excellent points all around. Um, but uh, gentlemen, we have two more stories to cover here. So uh, let's power through them real quick. Um, in an update of uh, speaking of uh, world leaders and such who you know seem to actually have the interest uh, of their people at heart here, um, uh, it has come out in the news this week that um, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, has been uh, reelected uh, as uh, uh, the leader of Russia you know, for uh, for another six year term, uh, I believe here, uh, with a uh, shocking eighty seven percent of the vote here. Now I know um, uh, many people have talked about uh, you know uh, AA brings this up a bunch, and many other people in our spheres talk about how. In an actual, you know, democratic system, this would probably be uh, something more likely that people will get like a uh, huge proportions of the vote and this stuff where it's like 50 50 all the time just you know, uh, when is that actually ever played out really uh, in history, you know, it's not really the sign of a functioning nation where like 50% of the people are at each other's throats all the time right, you know that this seems far more like a place you'd want to live under and such. But of course, this has been met with nothing but uh, calls of people saying, well, the only reason why Putin gets this uh, high of a uh, vote uh, in Russia is because he kills all of his opposition and he rigs all the pollsters and everything like this. And there's Ace. absolutely no way. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it might have something to do with it. but I mean, Yeah, yeah. But there's there's no call at all. Nobody in Russia actually likes Putin, right? This is what we're told. 
Right. Well, it's like these two things, both of these things can be true. Like he could be doing that. Um, and then also uh, maybe this uh, basically reflects the actual reality. It doesn't mean like people are entire. Obviously, if you talk to Russians, I mean, they're not uh, extraordinarily happy with Putin, uh, but it's not like they hate him or something like people tend to feel about politicians uh, in the U.S. He's, you know. So I, I don't know people. Yeah, it's I, I just wrote an article on this uh, published uh, yesterday, actually, on our on our sub stack. It's, it's really short. Um, you know, it's you have this idea that that in democracy, like for some reason that that basically means that, uh, you know, you sort of have this like two party 50 50 division. And if, if you don't have that, then you're not achieving, quote unquote, compromise like which is bizarre. Like the idea that the Republicans and Democrats as they are represent like a centrist compromise between what Americans want is just ridiculous. Um, you know, would it, would it really like, you, you've all seen that screenshot uh, a few that from years ago from Pew research, I actually linked it in the article where it's, it's that graph of like Republican and Democrat overlap. And it shows how they're, they're spreading apart and the, Oh no, the country's being becoming more divided, but like, how does that actually what bearing does that actually have on like whether or not the country's democratic or a good thing like why does everyone have to like basically agree like isn't the entire point of democracy that everyone gets their say like it's it's quite totalitarian actually when you think about this sort of expectation that everyone comes together and we're all going to like agree on how to agree like why is that actually a prerequisite for democracy um that you have these sort of equal and opposite opposition forces. Uh, why, you know, why, what, you know, Lyndon Johnson, for example, um, you know, his, he, he had uh, the largest popular vote share ever, uh, 61.1%. Um, so apparently the divide between like democracy and dictatorship is the 26.19% margin between, you know, what, what, president putin won what he won like where is that exactly like what what number are we actually allowed to go with and if you exceed that it's not democracy anymore i don't know it's just stupid you know so go read the article it's interesting that this is not the uh the first major world leader to win an election with 87 percent of the vote uh in the last several weeks but it is interesting that bukele didn't get the same hue and cry about killing all of his enemies and everything i mean there's people who kind of gave little token like limp wristed like oh but he kind of was mean but it's interesting that i mean i would i would find it given the russian people's history with regime change i would find it entirely believable that they're like eh, you know things have uh could things be better sure are things getting better maybe have things been a lot worse oh hell yeah they have uh let's just keep things as they are i mean i would i would completely believe i would completely understand that rationale from their perspective yeah the the vibe that i've gotten from uh you know russians and from uh people you know like westerners that have been over there i guess the idea is that like the russians are just really not like obsessed with politics to the degree that like people over here in the west are well mm -hmm. uh maybe that's uh you know, a quirk of their system. Maybe it's a quirk of, you know, just their biosphere of their people or something like that, you know, but uh, no doubt that's a factor here as well. I think part of it I, is, is also just being beaten into submission. Like they're, they know that there's nothing that they're like, why care about politics when you can't do anything about it? I, I think one of the interesting things that came out of that election though, um, that I talked about with Tom Luongo today, and I, I won't really get into it because he does a much better job on my show. It'll be out on Monday. Um, in Chechnya, he got 99% of the vote. And there's a Muslim eschatological, there may be a Muslim eschatological reason for that. They may see him as a sort of returning savior, a, re a returning messiah that defeats their enemies that has been reborn. Hmm. And um, yeah, you can you can turn into you can tune into my show on Monday to hear more about that because yeah, there's a tease. Well, it's also like in the Anglo-American world. I mean, especially in America, politics is just something we do for fun. Um, like, and that's that's fine. Like politics is like a is is in some sense kind of a game 
uh, you know, except when it's not um, for Americans, especially in the in the late 19th century, uh, you know, frankly, when the stakes are much lower uh, in, in Russia, like that's just not the case that, you know, people aren't into politics and super into republicanism and democracy there, because in Russia throughout its entire, you know, roughly 1000 year history, uh, politics is where you go for uh, a life and death struggle against some elite opponent, and you're probably going to die if you try to oppose the government. I mean, that's it's a t- totally different uh, mindset to them. Like we have this expectation that, like, okay, like the the Russians are they like adopted liberal democracy in 1991, and now they're going to like behave exactly as we do. Um, it's just it's incredibly provincial to go up to a Russian and, and start asking them about politics. Uh, it just makes you look like a total rube. That's why they get pissed off because no one likes talking to an idiot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, with with Bukele, it's like you know they can't lie about him because it's it's like well, trying to everyone just kind of admits that the people are happy with him and the West doesn't like that he's quote unquote authoritarian, whatever the hell that means. Like using authority is bad or something. Um, but you know they they kind of can't even pretend that the elections aren't totally legitimate. Where frankly, I I haven't even looked up coverage about. Uh, you know, Mr. Putin's uh, win here, but I'm assuming they're just like saying all kinds of stuff about, you know, how he's like cheated and killed his opponents and all of that. Um, but it's like, what, what do you expect, man? Like, like you said, it's like the Russians don't go for regime change. Like even when the, the, the general secretaries in the communist party uh, died and a new one came in, like that caused a lot of upset and they didn't even like that. So why would they, especially right now, why would they want to change their president? It doesn't make sense. And yeah, it's, it's not even like the margin is like absurdly high, right? It's like 87%. Like that's not even crazy, uh, to be honest. It'd be I one mean, thing if it was like 99%, you know? Uh, what's his name? And um, Salazar in Portugal won like four elections in a row with 100% of the vote. Based. <laughs> Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah, very much so. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, uh, when we talk about, you know, the, you know, the Lord of the Rings meme, right? Like meets back on our menu, boys. It's like, well, for, for, for the Russians, it's like, it's not like politics is back on their menu in the sense of like, you know, they're just playing for games, right? I mean, you have a, you, you run the largest country in the entire planet throughout a thousand years of your history. You had to deal with hordes of people from the steppe, whether it was Mongols or, um, you know, you had to deal with Napoleon, you had to deal with the Germans twice. I mean, like, it's not like they have two giant insurpassable oceans on both sides of them. I mean, they're a landlocked nation for the most part. They have to play like politics in the real, uh, kind of like you were saying, Charlie. So yeah, I could totally understand why the average Russian just, you know, doesn't really want to get involved. But uh, it's interesting to talk about nonetheless. Uh, and, you know, for, if for nothing else, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see, you know uh, uh what it's like where uh, a, a nation a leader of a nation that's clearly not like a third world shithole but still the guy in charge is at least in the back for his own people which none of us could say over here in the west i mean uh, of course like we also have to acknowledge at the same time like yeah it's not like russia is like a friend of america or anything like that or like the the great savior of the west or something like that they're a rival civilization with their own history and their own bio spirit but you know it it still is worth pointing out that well uh, Russia can have clean subways, but we can't, you know, because of my freedom. But anywho, uh, let's move on to our final story of uh, the evening here. And we're basically going to call uh, this uh, 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 segment here. Uh, yes, uh, Don Lemon did have breakfast this morning. So <laughs> let's go on and hear what he has to say. <laughs> trying to understand your logic here when it comes to DEI, because there's no actual evidence of what you're saying. No, I, I said so. If the standards, like, if, like, let's say, uh, I think that particular thing was re- referring to surgeons. Let's say a surgeon is, uh, is asked to, uh, a, <clears throat> a surgeon in training is asked to do a, a series of operations under the supervision of a senior surgeon, and they get a bunch of those operations wrong. If, 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 if that happens, and yet they are still approved to be a surgeon, the probability that someone will die, I think, at some point is high. Okay. I understand that, but that's a hypothetical. That doesn't mean it's happening. <laughs> I didn't say it was it's happening. You, yeah. you didn't say it was happening. I said it, I said it will. You, but I said if, 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 if we lower standards, people, people will die. <laughs> but why respond to something or put something out there that has not happened? 
<laughs> the guy the guy literally cannot understand hypotheticals it's literally the meme come to life <laughs> well no i mean this is this is like you do this in your everyday life like why imagine things that haven't happened it's like well how do you how do you even it's like he's too stupid to live uh <laughs> yeah it's like it's like uh what will happen if i run through this red light into oncoming traffic <laughs> you know i mean <laughs> uh, you can you can see kind of in I, I don't know, like as I'm watching him, you can see his brain breaking around this as he's trying to he's I think he's there's part of him that's trying to like sincerely grapple with what Elon is saying, but then he has like these bumpers in his head that he's bouncing off of. And his brain is just starting to short circuit, like smoke's coming out of his ears as he's trying to to both like like be critical like he needs to ask questions and he needs to press him and he's he's obviously wrong so there can be no consideration of him being right it's just a matter of going down this this you know kind of prosaic pathway that we are supposed to go down in hard interviews where we just challenge every single thing he says it's it's so surreal watching someone be completely not even in control of themselves no, and you could see in his body language. He actually, <laughs> he, actually <laughs> he, he actually collapsed for a moment, like he was like a robot resetting or something. Like I don't know if we can like replay yeah. that, but he literally like fell over and like reset, and he did that out of like sheer like, mental exhaustion and in, in trying to like comprehend this. Yeah, he just rebooted. Hypothetical that. Does I understand that, but that's a hypothetical. That doesn't mean it's happening. I didn't say it was, I, it's happening. You said, you didn't say it was happening. I said I said it will. You, but I said if 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 we lower status, people will, people will die. <laughs> you can just you, you can just imagine the <laughs> there he is. The, the, the producer the producer is like uh uh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. Elon's body language through this whole interview was really interesting because you can see you can see how shallow some of these people are politically like Elon he, he's 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 a he's a pretty politically naive person and it's it's genuinely perplexing to him that people could think or or operate this way you can see that the the autism is just is like overcoming him. He was getting like genuinely personally disturbed as the interview went on, and all the all the stupid shit libs in the replies were like, "Oh, you're you're, you're crying," but you could well, tell because... he was like genuinely disturbed. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you, dude? He's used to dealing with competent people. Yeah, he's yeah. used to dealing with people. He just tells them what to do, and they do it. He's not used to dealing with somebody who is. I mean, like literally probably ADIQ and, you know, doesn't know, you know, knows that they did eat breakfast this morning. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, I, I can't imagine what that's like. Yeah. Well, no doubt this is uh, playing into effect. Um, I guess we'll call it Elon's noticing posts that he does on Twitter pretty much by the day uh, at this point, you know, now bringing attention to the to the dangers of uh, DEI stuff, you know, and, and no doubt this definitely has an uh, impact, you know, personally for him, given that he's trying to, you know, get mankind to Mars and such, and he's being fought at every single step of the way here. But, you know, I think it's also like you said, um, uh, King Pilled and uh, Pete, like, he's just so used to actually being around competent people. And then when he actually realizes what the upper class of the regime the talking arms of the regime the people that are supposed to rule over us like talk about on the daily basis i mean like yeah i think it would be horrifying to somebody like elon who probably didn't really engage with politics too much until recently until the u.s government has literally tried to shut down twitter right yeah right. it's it's weird too that like why did they select don lemon for this um like this is a guy who's so stupid he needs help tying his shoelaces well, I guess what it was is that uh, Don Lemon is having a show on X, similar to uh, Tucker, uh, and and that's what the show was on. Yeah, so this was supposed to be his inaugural show, and <laughs> Elon fired him right after this. He's, he <laughs> Which said, is so amazing. Yeah, he was like, "No, we're, this is this," and you can tell, you can watch the moment in the interview where Elon was like, "All right, this fucking guy's done." 
Oh, I but, see. So this was this was more like Musk interviewing Lemon for a show. <laughs> well, yeah, it was. It was. He he tells him later on. He said the only reason I'm doing this this interview with you is because you're hosting a show on the X platform. Otherwise, I wouldn't even be here talking to you right now. And then, oh, okay. And then he they they booted him, and they leaked that some of the things that Don Lemon wanted as part of his contract was um, equity in X. He wanted a free uh, <laughs> cyber truck. He wanted, um, and he wanted uh, control over content moderation on the platform. Dude, how do these? Where do these people get off? They, I mean, Don Lemon is just the epitome of a of a journalist. It's like they think, uh, like we're supposed to wa- worship the the dirt they walk on. I mean, imagine the the entitlement to even come up with that shit. That's that's what I mean. That's really telling because it just sort of it shows you like what these people think of themselves like they still think they're important and in charge and like you have to come to them in order to to like even even have an opinion it's i can't even imagine thinking that way oh this is here so here's the list of things he wanted he wanted his tesla cyber truck a five million dollar advance on top of an eight million dollar salary an equity stake in x and the power to approve policy changes he also wanted a private (laughs) jet to vegas a luxury suite day drinking and massages for him and his fiance. He wanted like spinning rims on the truck too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and, and the jet. Well, uh, not to mention, uh, God knows what kind of uh, massages were entailed there between a gay man and his uh, fiance going to oh. Vegas. But, you know, the, the mind shudders the thing. But uh, <laughs> just the balls. A fucking Don Lemon. This idiot that got fired from CNN <laughs> coming into Twitter. And again, like this is this is the competency crisis. This is their big move. They're they're angling in on him. They're going to get one of the regime's loyalists embedded in the X platform. And the, Elon's like, what? What? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? How do you possibly think that I would say yes to something like this? It makes me wonder what um uh, uh, contract uh, Tucker Carlson managed to um uh, organize uh, with Elon. Uh, yeah, no doubt it was something way more reasonable than that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure Tucker's. I'm sure his salary is is in the millions, um, and but and like the thing is, like Tucker wouldn't be negotiating him with negotiating with him like a dickhead. He wouldn't be coming and like like asking for all this sorts of stuff. But I know, I, I know, Elon is like, well, we want X to be a platform for everyone. We don't want this to be like a partisan platform. So let's get some left wing people. They talk about that later in the interview, and and Lemon's like, you think I'm left wing? <laughs> and and and, and, ow, and that, that's ow. when Elon rebooted. Elon just kind of looked at him, and he's like, uh, 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 "Yeah, yeah, 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 you're you're left wing, yep." And then he was like, "He said, you know, Fox is right wing, CNN is left wing,'" and he's like, "You think CNN is left wing?" And it was just this oh is this is when when Elon started like ripcording his way out of the interview. He's like, "I've got people over here waiting to meet me. You know, you've got time for one more question." And then he just straight up refused to answer one of his questions. He says, no, that answer would take too long. I'm not going to answer it. Oh, wow. I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to watch the whole thing because that sounds actually pretty interesting. I don't know that. I think I'd get cramps from cringing. Yeah, you will. I have a really high cringe tolerance. So, <laughs> uh, uh, Well, you know, I think that rounds up uh, the stories uh, for this week, gents. Unless we have any final comments on... Um, uh, what Elon is going to be doing here. Uh, I mean, with uh, X going on into the future and grabbing more and more big names. I mean, it, it's just so bizarre to me, this idea that uh, I guess that Elon has like, oh, X is going to be for everybody. It's like, who who is Don Lemon pulling in? Like what audience does Don Lemon actually have, right? It, it, it's just CNN. People have CNN on in the background, you know, like the joke, uh, the airport news network, right? It's like, does Don Lemon even really have fans that would come and follow them from CNN over to uh, to X or something? I mean, Tucker's a special case, man. You know, like, it, it, I don't know if it would work. I mean, uh, what would happen if, like, someone like Joe Scarborough or Joy Reid, you know, from, like, MSN, like, came over to Twitter? Like, would they even bring anybody? Uh, it's just bizarre to me. It's like they're, they're a completely dead entity and trying to get them integrated with you know, uh, Twitter, like they, they just wouldn't thrive there. They would, it would just be, it'd be like Will Stansel times a million. You know, it would just be <laughs> our guys. It would be our guys in their comment section, like harassing them all day, uh, it, like with the guests they have on. 
Well, they, they don't even produce good content. I mean, think what you will about someone like Joe Rogan, but at least he's a good interviewer and manages to come up with pretty entertaining podcasts no matter who he has on. But, like, these people can't even have an interesting conversation. I think it goes back to what I said before about Elon, that that ultimately he's pretty politically naive. He still, he still buys into a lot of the ideas of, you know, like of neutrality and, and um, you know, I mean, I think he's, I think he's sliding his way down the same slope that all of us have slid down. Um, I think he's, he's definitely sliding down that, but I would imagine that a, you know, probably one of the busiest men in the world, uh, uh, an Uber billionaire probably isn't spending his time reading niche philosophy and stuff. He's just, you know, he's, he's shit posts on Twitter because it's his platform and he needs to drive engagement. And then he's got these particular issues that he's starting to get really concerned about. And He's getting exasperated because he just wants to do his business and he keeps having to jump through all these fucking hoops. And so he's just kind of like, all right, so let's have it. Let's have an open neutral platform. I don't want to be, I don't want to have be seen as like gab or whatever. So let's have an open neutral platform. Let's recruit. And then he's going to, he has his own social circles, which are all, you know, elitist, um, you know, Ivy leaguers and all the lawyers and everything, everyone that he interacts with, who a lot of them are just the regime creatures. So he he probably has an an outsized sense of Don Lemon's uh, influence on people, and then it gives him his token. You know, he, and there now I have a, I have a, I have a, a an unbiased platform, um, and but then once it became too much, what's interesting is like once it became a headache, and he realized okay, this is this the the juice isn't worth the squeeze here. Then he just pulled the ripcord. He just nope, you're gone, you're done, we're moving on. You would think that he would be hesitant to make a move like that given the potential political implications whatever it's like yeah fuck it whatever i'm already dealing with political shit storms right and left let's just just get him out of here and let's move on yeah i think what we're seeing with musk if um you know if i sort of think back i think some of the one of the first thing that breaks in like uh default liberal normie brain is like the realization that other people in in government and other positions of power like lemon are actually malevolent um, that's a pretty big realization. Like these people aren't just like making honest mistakes and they're mm-hmm. not just stupid. They're actually malevolent and realizing that is, is a big deal. And Musk seems to be coming to that realization. And then also this idea that like, you know, well, <clears throat> the people in power might make mis- some mistakes, but like, you know, they've been educated and, and know what they're doing and, and that sort of thing. But actually also know just the average listener to this podcast is more competent at, literally any job in the in the uh, federal bureaucracy right now like i guarantee you could just pick a yeah. random guy in chat put them in literally any the head of any department in the u.s and they'd be able to run it better than who is there now so when when you actually start realizing these two things i mean I, you know that's that's some of the first illusions that break when you're when you're sort of actually trying to study um politics for real and not just civics you know one-on-one bullshit um, and that's what's happening with Musk right now. Like he actually is still just on the like basic civic stuff. And he's, he's this old, he's older, he's very intelligent, but he's like never actually uh, like investigated this stuff um, like as we have. And I think we're kind of, we're kind of seeing him like sort of figure this out now. So it's, it's really interesting because he's such a prominent figure. Well, the, the vibe I've been getting from him is that, you know, it's almost like he's, uh, you know, reluctantly being pushed into this position of be having to engage in politics more and more in the sense of, of you no, know, yeah, exactly. You know, he's like, oh, uh, I'm Elon Musk. I'm one of the richest people in the world. I've got a goal in mind to do my, you know, neural link stuff. I've got a goal in mind to get man on Mars and all these things. And they'll basically the only public, uh, you know, facing uh, part that I wanted was to make my boring company with a bunch of flamethrowers and appear in Marvel movies talking to Tony Stark. But now the bullshit that is going on with DEI in the government is actively preventing me from doing what I actually want to do. And now you are forcing me to engage with all this low, like quality bullshit. You know, one of the interesting conversations I had with um, uh, Thomas over the weekend was talking about how all like the major competent people of our age, none of them want to get into government. They all want to get into business because the corporations and business actually hold way more power than uh people in like political office do uh these days like the people in politics are are fucking clowns they're idiots you know and elon is now like being forced to engage with this bullshit in order to just do business as usual well it's it's just like gamergate i mean 
we just wanted to play video games. Elon Musk is just the guy who just wants to run his billion dollar companies to do the things he's interested in. And it's like, you know, for some of us, and this is probably happening with him, it's like, okay, well, I really didn't want to get involved with this, but you've now pushed it to the point where I'll spend the rest of my life destroying you. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I expect that's going to happen with Elon Musk as well. Uh, you know, so I, I, I empathize greatly with, you know, where it seems like he's he's at right now. Yeah, exactly. Well, gents, um, this has been a great show. Let's finish up the last bit of the super chats here, and then we'll close down for the evening. Um, let's see, uh, Luthemplar again for five bucks. In many ways, the gospel for it, right? Stir them to jealousy by loving your people more than they do, and they will break. Yeah, no, no doubt. I'm um, talking about the the J question uh, from earlier there, but yes, um. Uh, Seasider for 10 bucks, one of our uh, strongest soldiers. He doesn't send us a salute this week. Oh man, uh, he, he's slacking there. But anywho, uh, I'm having a Java Mint cigar while I listen. Great show. Have a good night. Well, thank you very much, uh, Seasider, and uh, we'll do a salute for you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Garfellow uh, Roosevelt uh, for five bucks. Uh, looks like meat's back on the menu, boys. Avertation. <laughs> 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 yeah. Just, just think of all the fantastic new restaurants that we're going to get with the new oh, immigrants God. coming in. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, P. Budapest stuff uh, for five bucks. Uh, shorter Don Lemon Musk interview Lemon. So we looked at the data. Musk, okay, tip shit. <laughs> G to G. <laughs> uh, all right. And that is us all caught up on uh, the super chats here, but uh, this is a very fun show. Uh, I thought it was going to be a little bit more uh, black pilling when I looked at the stories for this week we were going to discuss, but we managed to have quite a bit of laughs in there. So we'll go around the horn here. Anyone have any uh, shilling they want to get done? Uh, Charlemagne, you wrote a sub stack on the OGC yesterday, but what else do you have cooking, sir? Uh, working on my book reviews. Uh, I've got this really interesting um, journal from 1994 about the, uh, it's a bunch of intellectuals writing about what comes after communism. So probably going to review that next on my own charlemagne.substack.com blog. Um, so that's all I've been really grinding out uh, the last couple of weeks. Cool, cool. And um, you did a uh, Ukraine update uh, stream uh, a couple of weeks back uh, that people should go check out uh, as well. I always learn a lot from uh, watching those as somebody who is not paying attention to the day-to-day -day goings on of the Russia-Ukraine war. So be sure to tune in to uh, Charlie's coverage of it. Um, uh, Pete, what do you have, sir? Um, Pete Quinone show. Got uh, episode episodes that just dropped today with Thomas. Um, I have a uh, episode with Tom Luongo coming out on Monday, doing reading through of disquisition on government by Calhoun, John C. Calhoun, the probably the greatest uh, political thinker in American history. And uh, I got a substack dropping tomorrow talking about bloodbath and uh, just exactly uh, you know, what what do you what what should we think about them using the term bloodbath and um, you know, basically chopping it up like they did for um, for very fine people. So um, check that out, PeteSubstack.com and PeteQ.org is the uh, podcast. Sweet. Yeah, definitely uh, be sure to tune in to uh, Pete's stuff. Definitely one of the premium uh, thinkers on our side of uh, things here. And he's always got good uh, value. So, And uh, our special guest, Mr. Kingpield, sir, uh, anything to show? Yes, thank you guys for having me here. This was a lot of fun. Um, uh, Kingpilled is the name YouTube channel. Uh, it's on all the podcatchers as well. Uh, and then real Kingpilled on Twitter. Our last few shows that we've done, uh, were actually very interesting ones. I think anybody who's listening to this would probably enjoy, uh, we did a live reading through Curtis Yarvin's most recent post on monarchy. And then, uh, also did a, a live reading through the, the piece in Politico about JD Vance recently, which I think is very telling about uh, some of the direction that the Republican Party is moving. Uh, and then we did an interview with a, a good friend of the show named Sean Wheland, who uh, has a really interesting take on how the the uh, public stock market was the way, is basically kind of like a form of soft communism. And it's the way that the managerial revolution funded itself. Um, and then he's got some predictions for the d direction the stock market is heading here in the near future. Um, as, as the boomer generation is coming up and uh, beginning to become net takers from uh, their 401ks. So those are the last few episodes we've done. They're pretty interesting. We've got some more good interviews coming up in the future. So we'd love to have you guys come join us. 
Yeah, definitely. We can um, uh, definitely uh, set that up and definitely people should be listening uh, to all the fine work that these gentlemen are putting out. Um, uh, for myself, uh, you can catch me on Sundays on um, uh, Post Zero on Mr. Jack Napier's uh, channel. And uh, that is pretty much all I have to show uh, for the moment here. Um, I'm going to be recording with Thomas uh, one of these days soon. So that'll be out on uh, his podcast probably in the coming weeks. But I'll announce that when we get there. And, uh, and I will once again shill uh, the conference. Uh, go to theoldgloryclub.com to get your tickets uh, to the conference in June. We'd love to have you guys there. We'd love to see you. And we're going to have a great fun time there as always. And uh, everyone be sure to tune in next week uh, for the show. We're going to have some uh, great announcements coming up as to some of the things we're working on over here at the OGC. So watch the space and we'll see you next week.